Hey, baby. Hello. Welcome everyone to this webcast, part of our nano prep time where we're all getting ready to try to write um, our novels in November. Do you hear a little squeaking in the background? That's a baby who's off screen and he's obsessed with airplanes right now. So yeah, so he points, he's pointing to airplanes in the book. So if I pause every so often and say, that's an airplane, it's because that's what he's pointing at. Oh, it's an airplane. So I'm really excited to be here with um, Novely, both the founder of Novely and also some really amazing young writer guests. And I'm gonna give a little introduction for them and then pass it off because they're here to talk about world building. Um, and I know that something you guys, that's an airplane. You guys are all here to, that's a cargo jet to learn about. <clears throat> um, and I'm like, as he's squeaking, I'm thinking this could be a scene in a novel, you know, like chaos, right? That can be part of a world, make it thematic. Um, okay, so novelly. Um, maybe you've been to a novelly webcast. We've done a couple with them before. We really love working with them. Um, Anna, who's here, is the founder of Novely, which is a nonprofit on a mission to publish literature by diverse young authors and get youth authors taught in every 8th to 12th grade English classroom so that every student can feel seen and inspired by what they read in school, which is a mission that we're super excited about, too, and really, like, always glad to work with you um, to support that. If you're joining us in the chat, feel free to drop in. You could drop your name. You could drop where you're coming from. Since this is a webcast all about world building, you can also share maybe a little bit about the world of your novel if you know what it is so far. And even before we get started and I pass it off to Anna, I'm excited because sometimes people think world building is just for sci-fi or fantasy, which it definitely is. But anytime you're writing a novel or a novella, you're building a world. Um, so I'm, I think we all can learn something too. All right, Anna, glad to talk. That's an airplane. Um, I'm going to pass it off to you <laughs> and I'll turn my camera off, but I'll be in the background and you'll see me in the chat. So if you have any questions during this webcast or want to ask questions to our panelists, feel free to um, drop that in the chat and I will, you see an arm now, I'm trying to keep him off screen. We're trying not to let him be on images until he's 18 or whatever. So <laughs> that's the debut of his arm. Anyway, drop in the chat. I'll pass it on. Now I'm glad to pass it off to Anna. Wonderful. Well, thank you so much to the NaNoWriMo team for having us. I'm very excited to be here. I know our youth authors are really excited to be here. My name is Anna Casalme. I use she, her pronouns. I'm from San Francisco. And, um, you know, instead of giving you my formal bio, I know um, that the topic of world building also matters to me in my writing project that I'm going to be working on in November with all of you. Um, with my writing project, um, I'm writing a young adult novel. Um, that is about a Filipino American teenage girl who is saving her family's lumpia and dumpling shop in Southern California while her grandmother helps her from beyond the grave. So with world building, it's it's a very contemporary setting, very much based on where I grew up. Um, but there is this element of the ghost plane and also the material plane that is a big part of my novel where a lot of my world building, um, particularly how that works, like how ghosts can appear in different contexts, how that works is like a big part of my world building um, elements um, and practice. So, but of course we're not here for me. <laughs> we're here to learn about world building from our youth authors um, who I have been very proud to have worked with for 2023. Um, so without further ado, I would really love for you to meet all of them. Um, so starting with Chase, can you just tell us a bit about yourself? Um, hello, everybody. My name is Chase Kim. I use he, him pronouns. I am 16 years old and I'm a junior at Yorba Linda High School in California. And from last spring until now, I've been a part of Novelies Rising Voices Collective. And through the Rising Voices Collective, um, I've written my novella, which is called Red Status which I'll be talking a lot more about later. But um, yeah, Red Status addresses the topic of race, as particularly anti-Asian hate. Thank you so much, Chase. And then moving on to Isla, can you tell us a bit about yourself? Yeah, sure. <clears throat> um, I'm Isla McCullough. I use she, her pronouns. I'm from Clinton, New York, but I go, I'm a first year at Oberlin College right now, and I'm 18. And I wrote my novella Inside Out and Up Above and Inside Out. I 
um, which I'll tell you more about later. Great. Thanks, Isla. And last but not least, Ace. Hi, guys. My name is Ace Bell, but as you can see in the description, I go by my initials A and B in my writing works. I use he, they pronouns. I'm 18, attending the University of Michigan Ann Arbor as a freshman in their second second semester, which makes me kind of untraditional, but um, I start in the summer. <laughs> Um, I was also a part of the Rising Voices Collective of 2023, where I published my novella in the Novelty Library titled The Royal with Two Faces, which discusses race, sexuality, and identity within an African kingdom. Fantastic. Okay, thank you all. And I'm sure everyone is so um, on the edge of their seat to hear more about the novella that you all mentioned. Um, So in reverse order... Um, so Ace, could you tell us a little bit more about the novella that you have published in the Novelty Library? Yes, of course. Um, so as I said, my novel is titled The Royal with Two Faces. I would like to say that it's a mixture of coming of age, romance, and fantasy, which are also my top three favorite genres of all time. So no surprise there. Um, my novella asked the question, what if you had to choose between the fate decided for you or what you really truly wanted? The story follows Janina, which is the main character, a princess of the kingdom Castile, who goes to public high school for the first time with her brother, the prince of Castile, Jasper. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> she soon finds herself choosing between teenage life that she's always wanted with who she wanted and the life her kingdom depends on, ultimately her taking the throne. I would like to say that the story captures the struggles of growing up and discovering paths of yourself, such as your sexuality, your stance on politics and media, and your purpose in life and your identity. And if I had to give a comparison, I'd say it's probably kind of like Princess Diaries meets the next week show, Young Royals. I think it's safe to say that everyone who's watching this is gonna have three new books to read. <laughs> um, thank you, Ace. All right, so Isla, can you tell us about your novella as well? Yeah, so my book, Up Above and Inside Out, is about Luna, a 12-year-old girl who travels to another world whenever she acts on bursts of creativity. She's happy ignoring the real world, wanting nothing to do with it, until her teacher brings up climate change in class. Her world of imagination begins to crumble, forcing her to face the truth of why it exists and what she will do to save it. Because if she doesn't, all that will be left is the real world. I wanted to write this because I wanted to talk about how climate change and differing attitudes around climate change are affecting how we go about our daily lives. Awesome. Thank you, Isla. And before we move on to Chase, I just really wanted to highlight something that Rachel Gasparic in the chat said, um, quote, it moves me to tears seeing these young writers so passionate and eager to create the foundation of their writing careers. Um, And I just want to say to Rachel, same. (laughs) Thank you so much for saying that. Um, And then last but not least, Chase, could you tell us about your novella? My my novella is called Red Status. Um, As far as genre, I would consider it a work of speculative slash dystopian fiction. It does take a lot of inspiration from historical events, but it's not really based in historical time period, so not really historical fiction. Um, It does, however, deal with the idea of this kind of distorted timeline. So in a way, I think it also has some elements of science fiction. Um, I began writing this novella when anti-Asian hate crimes were very prevalent following the COVID-19 pandemic, and the novella asked the question, what would happen if these kinds of hate crimes continued? So I wrote what I, I, what I would call an, kind of an extension of, re, of our reality, just kind of in a slightly exaggerated form. The, so the premise of the novel is that Asian Americans are rounded up into protection camps against worsening violence, um, which of course is only a ruse for general Asian American distrust. And so the rest of the novel follows the journey of a teenage boy, Sun Shin, in one of these camps as he navigates this new world and ultimately escapes from it. Fantastic. Thank you, Chase. So obviously this topic that we are discussing during this webinar is world building. So naturally, my next question for you all is um, I'd love to know more about how you describe the world of your novella. So let's start with Isla. Um, I think the best word I could use to describe that alternate world that my main character travels to is colorful. Um, When I was trying to create it, I just basically thought of 
the most bright, most paradise, paradise like world that I could possibly think of, and then tried to make that into one place. Thank you, Isla. And I would say that that's, um, that is the word that I would use to describe having read your work as well. Um, Ace, can you tell us more about the world of your novella? Yeah, so I would probably describe the world of my novella as realistic and relatable, but also majestic in a way, because my novella takes place in a world that's not very different from our own. I mean, it has schools, it has social media and news media, it has regular neighborhoods, regular houses, you know, things that we wouldn't really blink an eye at. But what makes it majestic is the fact that it takes place in the center of this kingdom that has like this super majestic, super fantasy oriented kingdom that you would normally see in a fairy tale or maybe even something like, I don't know, Harry Potter. And I think that's what makes it majestic and kind of beautiful and different from our actual world. So I think that it's pretty relatable. Like when you read it, you would be able to find different aspects of it that are relatable to our own world, but you would also kind of be taken into a fantasy aspect. Thank you, Ace. Yeah, I um, when you said Princess Diaries, I that's what came to mind reading your work too. That and also, I don't know if this movie's too old for the three of you, but Ellen Enchanted, <laughs> um, where Ellen Enchanted, it's like it is fantasy. Um, it takes place in a kingdom, but the kingdom also has a mall. <laughs> um, so thank you for sharing that. And then lastly, Chase, can you tell us about the world of your novella? Um. I would definitely say my world is based in reality because it does exist in this kind of extension of our timeline of our reality. It adopts many features of our world. Um, but yeah, one thing I really strive for when I was creating this world is just to make it real. So the point is that it's supposed to seem at first like this kind of outlandish kind of idea. Like we scoff at the idea of like, oh, prison camps for Asian Americans in our modern society. But at the same time, you can very clearly see that Sunshin's world, this world that I created, is very deeply rooted in the current treatment of Asian Americans and in historical events, most prominently um, in the treatment of Japanese Americans during World War II. So in this very real world, I aim to immerse the reader in this seemingly absurd world, but then eventually real, reveal how rooted in reality it is. So it adopts many features of our world. Um, so it doesn't really create any features, but it tweaks history, social customs, so that these changed features have a huge impact on the characters the plot and ultimately the message. Fantastic. And just if you're, if anyone's looking at the chat, um, we already have some folks who are committing to reading these. So this is really exciting. All right. So when we think of the term world building, um, words like believability, rich or richness, engaging and immersion often come up. Which of these words or another word that I haven't mentioned most resonate with your approach to world building. Um, and let's start off with Chase, just to mix it up. Yeah, I guess my the first word that comes to mind is again real. I know I keep saying it, but really, really what I was aiming for is to make this one change to the world, this slight exaggeration of what was already happening to kind of to make the world completely different. So that's the first thing. But I think immersive is a really good one. The ultimate goal you know, is to immerse the reader in this world, really feel the experience of the main characters. And I think that's difficult to do in a world that's, um, you know, in a world that doesn't immerse the reader. So I think those two words are really what I strive for in my writing and in my world building. Great. And can we hear from Ace next? Yeah, so when it comes to me making up a world, I really want my readers to be engaged and immersed in the world. Um, when I first start writing the or making the world for Little Royal with Two Faces, the first thing that I wanted was for the world to be so immersive, so immersive that like the reader just gets caught up in it. Even though my world is very realistic and very like relatable to what we already have there, the fact that it's a kingdom that is built off of Africa that is also kind of tied to the United Kingdom in a way, it's 
hopefully engaging with the reader and making them feel like they're really there and like they can visualize what I'm saying and they can visualize and imagine all of the different things that I've said or described of the world. Great. And lastly, Isla. Yeah, along with along with colorful, I would say that what I was trying to do with this world is make it perfect because I wanted a direct uh, contrast to the real world. And the point is that um, Luna's world is so, so different and so much better than what she perceives that the real world is that she only wants to spend all her time there. And that's where her conflict comes in with whether she wants to save the real world or just keep escaping to her like, perfect world. Thank you, everyone. Um, I So later I was gonna ask you all a question about whether you take more of a bono up or top down approach to world building. But we had a question in the chat so I, I'm going to move that question up further. So Jeffrey asks, which came first, your world of the story or your story idea? Um, and we can start with Ace. Um, for me, definitely the characters and like the actual storyline of the novella came first which is bottom up. Um, so I definitely took a bottom up approach to this. Like I already had a feeling of what I wanted my characters to look like, to act like, to feel, to dress. Like I just knew what I wanted for the, for the characters. And as I knew what I wanted and I just drifted farther and farther into the storyline, my world just started to build itself around that. So I kind of just um, took it as I went. As the character was getting dressed, I had to think about, oh, what should the bathroom look like? What should her palace look like? What should the school look like? And that's just kind of how my world came about. I just kind of let it build itself around the characters. Awesome, and I'm gonna popcorn it over to Chase. Um, for me, they kind of, they went very hand in hand because the uh, the events of the plot are very, very driven by the world. Like nobody would be in this situation if the world didn't exist in the first place. Um, so for my more specific writing process, I had this idea first, this question of what if Asians were put into protection camps like Japanese internment in, during World War II. So that was really my first thought. And then from that, I immediately went and wrote the opening chapter of my novella. So yeah, it's definitely a lot of flipping back and forth in my case between the world and the plot because they're so closely intertwined um, in my case, that I found it was difficult to completely separate them from one another. Great, and Isla. For me, it was also it was also kind of hand in hand. But the first thing that came to my mind was my main character, Luna, and the fact that she bounced between these two worlds. So, from my first idea of her, I then I started going into what the world would look like. Um, being a colorful, um, perfect world. And then from there, the story idea came based on that, based on like what, what would make that perfect world fall apart and what would she do to fix it? Thank you all. Um, and I hope that answered your question, Jeffrey. Um, so I would love to know more about your writing process. Um, can you all give a specific example of how you approached world building for your novella? So this might be like an action or like a practice that you took, like something very process oriented. Um, so let's start off with Ace. Yeah, so um, one thing that I like to do for any of my worlds that I built in any of my stories is I kind of just let myself sit with my thoughts for a moment. And sometimes I'll even like watch things or read things that are similar to what I want. For example, if I was trying to create some type of fantasy world or using my book, for example, with The Royal with Two Faces, I really wanted it to have a world that is very similar to maybe Wakanda from 
Marvel. Um, so I did watch Black Panther before I started thinking about my world. And as I continue to sit with my thoughts and think about how I want my characters to act, how I want my characters to look, how I want my characters to talk, I just kind of let things from our actual world or things that I viewed in our world, like any media or any stories or any movies. And I kind of just took little bits and pieces and drifted them into a world that complemented my story. Great. Thank you, Ace. And I, I definitely, now that you met, I didn't know that before you just said it, that you took a lot of inspiration from Wakanda, but now um, that you mention it, I completely see that where it's, it's very much rooted in the real world, which allows you to touch on real issues in meaningful ways. And I know that's something that you're very passionate about is um, engaging with like issues that real people face, particularly marginalized communities, um, but doing it in such a way that, um, you know, allows for like magic to be real and like, like really um, like elements, like there, it does not have to always be so dark, um, but it could, but it could be very real and authentic and grounded in that way. So thank you for sharing that. Um, Chase, what about you? Can you give us a little bit more about your process too? Yeah, um, yeah, I guess it's a little similar to the last question, but yeah, I definitely started with my world in the writing process. So I guess the question for me is not so much how my maybe my uh, world building process supplemented my plot, but maybe more how my world process or my writing process, sorry, surrounded this world of my creation. Um, so yeah, I was very driven by the question of this altered world. I know I mentioned before that the second I had this idea for the world, I went down, wrote the opening chapter. Um, so for a specific moment, I would say that it was just maybe sparks of inspiration, which is how I tend to write. Um, but I think some more specific moments can be found in Sunshin's interaction with nature. Um, from the very first point that I had, or that I had the idea for this world, I knew his interactions with this kind of this natural scenery, scenery around the camp were going to be very important. Um, so I really had those planned out from the beginning, where they were going to be, their significance, um, etc. So, and eventually the natural scenery becomes this very important symbol of Sunshin's liberation uh, from the camp and society. So, yeah, the world, again, the world and the plot were very intertwined in my writing process, and that writing process definitely, definitely surrounded this altered world that I came up with in the very beginning. Awesome. Isla? Yeah, so I think mine... I, yeah, I, I picked, when I was trying to think of my world, I knew I wanted them all to be sort of outside um, the like perfect nature scene. So I would think of uh, uh, parts of the outdoors that I really liked. And then it was almost like putting them on max saturation and stuff. So putting the colors as bright as I could think of them in my head and then writing them down like that. And another Another source of um, images would be Pinterest. So I'd go on and find like really like perfect uh, nature and paradise scenes. And then I would let, write those down. These are all really great approaches. Um, before I move on to the next question, I just wanted to make an observation. I think it's so interesting how um, Isla, you use, you use the worlds as a contrast. Um, so like you have something that you call oversaturated, colorful, like utopic maybe, would that be the right word to describe the other dimension that your main character travels to? Um, so there's like this contrast at play. Ace, you very much have it inter intertwined. So you have like like a contemporary setting, but then you have... Um, you have like all these fantastical elements that make it more empowering. I think it makes it more fun. Um, I think it makes the romance really, uh, like just vibrant. Um, and then chase your world building. I feel like, um, it's like on the, it's like similar to Isla's, but like in the opposite end, right? Like it's, a, it's, um, it's bringing up like 
what is it like what a, what the opposite of utopic is right <laughs> just really um like like the the where the world could go in in the in a bad direction as opposed to a good one so um i that was just an observation to say that i think these are three very cool unique perspectives chase did you have something to say yeah i just wanted to add um that you're talking about my writing process yeah the really what I was trying to do is kind of create this flawed society that was really a reflection of the society that we live in. Um, but that really shows how close we were at one point to this world that we call dystopian, but which was, you know, almost true. So I think, yeah, what you were talking about describes my world being what my world building process perfectly. Yeah, I, I think what I what strikes me about all three of your work is like, how we're not actually that far from anything that you've written. Um, and like, I I find your work really optimistic, right? Like it could, it could, like we could enact all of these solutions to climate change. Like it is really hopeful. Um, so it could be like, we're very close in an optimistic way or in like a, in a very like dystopian way. Um, so I, and Chase, thank you for, for sharing that. Um, great. So we're going to move on to what the question I was super excited to ask, um, which, and I think everyone would love to hear about, which is, can you read an excerpt from your novella that highlights the world building? So we'll, we'll dive a little deeper into each person with this question. Um, so let's start off with, with Chase. Um, can you read an excerpt in your novella? Yes. Um, so here's what, well, I actually, I just, I have two that I would really like to read. Um, the first one is kind of describing his situation with other people in the camp. Another one's more about the natural scenery that I talked about, because I felt like I, I should talk about the natural scenery after I've talked about its symbolism. So the first part is, a guard watches behind me. He hasn't spoken a single word, but he communicates with jabs to the ribs and pokes into the back to keep me walking where I'm supposed to be. His all crimson uniform burns my eyes. Over the past week, I've gotten used to seeing flashes of red moving around everywhere. If one passes, even if you're in your peripheral vision, it means you have to walk on eggshells. Damn, reds, the older people call them, watching us all the time. And so now here's the natural part. So, well, that part was kind of introducing the people, the guards, kind of this dystopian uh, camp that they're in. And then this part is where he's longing to be outside. They've started to let us go outside, and I spend most of my time staring at what's outside of the gate. Every color here is dulled. The wind howls through beige grass, blasts into a gray building, mixes with colorless clouds. I don't think I've seen the sun in days, and I think the shriveled pine just outside the fence would agree. I stare with longing at the cragged gray peaks. So those were the two. Yay! And I uh, just wanted to share that in the chat. Um, my excitement was not just by myself. Other people were really looking forward to hearing you read it. Um, so Chase, with both, can you talk a little bit more about each of those excerpts in terms of like why you wanted to highlight them and what about that the world building that you did in both excerpts that you're really proud of? Yeah, um, I guess I'll touch first on what I was hoping to develop with both of these passages. So the first one where um, it's really talking about the guards it's really people centered. I mean, that's what really what I was trying to get out there. We're talking about his interactions with the guards, how other people are reacting to the guards, um, you know, and that kind of contributes. Also, it's where I first introduced the color red, which is to become very important throughout the course of the novella. But yeah, I thought that passage was really, really important. Um, just introducing everything in exposition, introducing the guards, his whole situation, how he's uh, reacting to it and how other people are reacting to it. And then the second part is also an introduction, but this time of um, the outdoors. So obviously in this camp, he's going to have a longing to escape. And that's where I'm introducing it later. But it's not, you know, some kind of like idyllic place. It's not a perfect place outside the camp. It's still something that's dulled. It's still, you know, cragged, gray, shriveled, all of that. So it's still not perfect, but it's a better reality than being oppressed inside the camp. So that's, I hope to answer the question. I, that's what I was trying to go for there. Um, what I was trying to develop in both of those passages. It definitely did. Um, I have, uh, so I'm, I'm going to ask a, a more specific personalized follow-up question for each of you about your excerpt, but for Chase, I, I'm curious about um, like the, your, your emphasis on the natural world and the, 
in the later excerpt, because when I think about, you know, dystopian and like uh, dystopian literature, and also like, you're really emphasizing like, like society, like society did this, right? <laughs> like, like people did this. So in the first excerpt, you're highlighting like dynamics and power um, and interactions between like people in power and people who don't have power. Um, so I'd love for you to talk more about like in a dystopian setting, like why, um, why focus on the main character's relationship with the natural world and like focus on that aspect of your world building. Yeah. Um, so yeah, like you mentioned, power dynamics are very important in the second, or there, sorry, in the first passage that I chose. In this second passage, it's really about, like I said, his eventual liberation, because when he eventually escapes, sorry, if that's a spoiler. It's not, it's not much of a surprise given the situation that he's in, that he's trying to escape the entire time. But, you know, he kind of has this, not an obsession, but he's very, very focused on the outside. It's something that when he's like, you know, scouting to escape, he's very focused. Where can I go? How am I going to survive in the wild? Um, but yeah, that, I guess it's representative, and what I was trying to get at when I was writing this, it's representative of his kind of enlightened perspective, because everyone else, no one else is really focused on the outside. He's really the only one who's focusing on this. But at the same time, it's not some perfect world that he's trying to escape to. He just has this perspective that he needs to escape, and he knows enough that he is trying to escape from this world. He's not letting himself be brainwashed. So I think the natural scenery is this kind of connection outside of this dystopian world, like I was talking about, his connection to the real world, elements of the real world that really influenced, that really influenced the novella. Fantastic. I love that. And that makes perfect sense to me. Like it, like, I think one of the great things about world building and all of these elements that you all are talking about is the opportunity to um, hold up mirrors to society, to like reflect things in a way that is pretty like stark or like pretty obvious and, or, or like to highlight certain things about society in maybe a more exaggerated way and therefore to make it clearer. So um, I think like contrasting the camp and the main character's relationship to the camp, to the, his relationship with the natural world, um, I think is super interesting. Um, okay, so you're you're out of the hot seat, Chase. <laughs> we'll, we'll move on to we'll move on to another youth author, but but thank you for reading it. That's it's I mean, I've obviously read your work, but I it's always nice to hear it read by the person who wrote it. Um, okay, so let's let's move on to Isla. Can you read an ex start off by reading an excerpt of your novella? Yeah, of course. Um, so I have one where she's just um gone from the real world back to um, her um, special world. Um, the pull toward her world had come even before drawing the second branch of a lilac tree. The moment her feet hit the neon grass and she could see Roan in front of her, waiting patiently on a log, she started talking. Let's explore somewhere new today. Roan had looked at her for a moment, then nodded. Okay. He got up and grabbed her hand, and the colors swirled for a moment before settling to reveal a forest opening up in front of them. A turquoise fox slinked off in the bushes, while chocolate brown birds sat in the trees, chirping sweetly. Without hesitation, Luna ran in. So yeah, that's just, um, she has, along with her perfect world, she has her like best friend that also um, lives in this perfect world. And so at the beginning, at least, um, she has it's like someone to complain to and just have fun with. Um, you're getting a lot of snaps in the chat <laughs> for amazing writing. Thank you. <laughs> um, oh, so same question, Isla, what about the world building in this excerpt do you want to highlight? Is there something about it that you're particularly proud of? Tell us more. I think I'm proud of just, um, I like to also, as well as um, going for specific like natural scenes and making them colorful, I liked picking random animals and giving them random colors um, and odd ones that you wouldn't necessarily associate with like a turquoise fox 
because by giving by making like even the animals look super odd um it just it gives that feeling of like complete otherness that I was going for Fantastic. And my like personalized um, or more specific follow-up question for you is um, something I've observed about your writing is that I think you're, you like to add these little details and I can tell it's just for your own delight. <laughs> um, and because you thought it was fun. Um, can you tell us more about um, maybe like, is there like one or two details that uh that we could find in in this particular book that for you were just like really fun for you <laughs> and like maybe it didn't have like a greater meaning or could maybe it didn't have like this greater meaning or purpose for the plot but were just like just like nice things for you <laughs> yeah I liked um I liked making uh, like I liked making the animals different colors I liked little moments when the world kind of didn't agree like with Luna like there's one section where she like kicks a flower and it like bounces back at her a little bit um like it's trying to cheer her up but in a slightly like um not aggressive but like um sort of like tough love kind of way and that wasn't strictly necessary but it gave me a lot of joy and we love that and if what is the point if not to, you know, be be there for your own joy or your own processing? Um, all right, Isla, I relieve you <laughs> of the hot seat. And last we have Ace. Can you read an excerpt in your novella? Yeah, of course. So um, this excerpt that I'm about to read, just to give a little backstory, is from chapter one. It takes place during the time where the main character and her brother are being driven to school for the first time, and she's kind of just observing the world around her. So um, I'll start reading now. Sure, I'd been outside of the palace walls on rare occasions, but I'd never seen the world from the point of view of just a citizen. To be outside, in a normal car, witnessing normal things just happening right in front of you. It was exhilarating. Simple things like skateboarding, eating McDonald's on the walk to school, or laughing with friends as you get Starbucks are things that almost every average person takes for granted. Me? I love the opportunity to indulge in it, to bask in the life that others live with no worries of my royal studies, taking the throne, or finding a worthy suitor. That's the excerpt. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> um, and, you know, same question. What about the world building in this excerpt are you particularly proud of? Yeah, so um, this particular excerpt is actually based off of me. So um, it was at a time where I had just switched high schools. I went to two high schools. The first one I went to, I experienced a lot of adversities um, with homophobia and racism. And that was the reason why I switched to a new high school. And um, on the first day that I switched to my new high school, I was kind of just observing the other people that were outside and like, you know, walking to school. My high school was right across from a McDonald's. And so I was just kind of watching people um, eating McDonald's as they walked across the street to our school and kind of just observing people in the way that seemed kind of like an out-of-body experience because here I am a new student in junior year and I just came from like this horrible high school where I experienced so much hate and just harassment for who I was and um, I think I put this in my story to just enhance or highlight the um real world aspect of it because that was a real feeling that I had and it's relatable to so many other people who have faced adversities for being who they are and so just putting that part in my story kind of like just enhanced the whole point of my world being relatable and a part of the real world but also kind of more like of a utopian fantasy type world as well yeah um I, uh, so I'm, I'm from California and 
the, so something that we always did after school was go to (laughs) In-N-Out. And I think, I think, you know, it's not McDonald's, but it's a similar vibe. And I, I, I agree that those details that you shared, um, even if it's like, there's a kingdom and there's prince and princesses or, or whatever, um, like all of these different elements of infant that you can find in fantasy, like it feels very, um, real. Um, and so my question for you is, I think something that you've brought up, um, again and again, is like how important it is for your writing to be relatable, um, and to be, uh, close to our reality, even if it is fantasy. And even if, um, it has like all of these other elements and like, I just love to know why, like, why is that so important for you? Um, for me, one of the things that, um, ma- really makes me want to write stories that are highly relatable, even if they are in the genre of horror, or they're in the genre of fantasy, like any genre, I want it to be relatable, mostly to my community, because it is so, it's not very often that you get to see, um, people of color written with plots like being a prince or being a princess or being uh, like the main character of this wonderful story and even queer people don't often see themselves written in popular narratives so one of the biggest things for me is that I want the stories to be relatable to people like me so they finally get to see a story written with them as the main character that does all these wonderful things that they've seen plenty of other people do but just have never seen themselves do. I love that. I am, um, and ob- and obviously that's why I'm a huge fan of you <laughs> and <laughs> and Isla and Chase is because I think you know we we all share this. It's so important for for um, people of color, queer folks, to be able to see themselves represented in stories um, and to know that their experiences matter and are worthy of being. Um, stories that other people read as well. Um, so thank you all for for sharing that. Um, so I'm going to move into our bonus round questions. That so less so about um, your specific novellas, even though I'm sure we could talk about it forever, um, and more just about world building in general. Um, so with world building, there's basically like an unlimited number of things you can work on, right? Like you could work on the laws of nature, the mechanics. Um, culture, language, history, geography, social customs, like it's, it's, it's a, it's your story. Like you can really, you could really do what you want for it. Um, right now with my young adult novel that I'm working on, um, something I've had a lot of fun figuring out is the mechanics of, um, like how, like where ghosts can be, um, and so like the way that I've incorporated it is like with ancestral altars. So if you have like candles or like offerings or um, like photographs where you have like elders or ancestors, which we have in in my family and my cultural background, um, that's where uh, ghosts can, um, that's how ghosts can access the material plane um, and see like what is is happening with their family. Um, So that's been a lot of fun for me to like figure out because it's, it's my world. Like I can do whatever I want. (laughs) I can do what I want with it. Um, so for each of you, which is your favorite aspect of world building to play with and why? Um, and I'd love to start with Isla. So for me, I think my favorite part is playing with how it feels. Um, so less so of a specific like customs and laws kind of thing because if I really try and focus on that then I know I'm gonna get into like a big like loophole like uh, rabbit hole and so I like to focus on how I want it to feel like um, what um, what vibes I wanted to give off and uh, how I want the reader to feel it um, because I think how the world makes you feel is a significant portion of how the whole book is going to make you feel and so even if you have the story is important in making you feel things but the world is going to affect the story so much that I like to think about how 
they will go hand in hand in creating the overall feeling for the reader. Ace, what about you? Um, um, oh, did you say? Chase, I said Chase. <laughs> I know you would. Okay. <laughs> um, <laughs> Well, I've always been so amazed by authors who can create their entire worlds before writing even a little bit of a plot like Lord of the Rings, stuff like that, who can just create these new languages, geographies, histories, cultures. Um, I've never actually done it myself. I guess it would be something that I would be eager to do in the future. But yeah, I've never written that. So what I've most often played with is probably history and social customs. Um, yeah, I think history and social customs when creating the society are often very, very important um, in how the plot rolls out, how your main characters act and behave and interact with the world. So I think those two are the ones that I've most often worked with and tried to develop in my stories. But yeah, I'm fascinated by I'm fascinated by languages. And so I would love to try to create a new one in some world in the future. Um, follow-up question for you, Chase. Is there a like a piece of history or social custom, the elements that you mentioned that are in red status that you're that you're particularly like proud of or or like to would like to highlight? Yeah, I think why from red status, I did a lot of research on Japanese internment. Japanese internment was really a historical event that drove it because it is so similar. Um and it's so similar to the, with this protection camp that Sunshin's in. So that's one piece of history that I really took. Saying I took inspiration from it sounds weird, but I drew upon, you know, this historical event to, you know, feel the situation that my character's in. So I think especially that's something that I worked on. Um, and, you know, if I think about my story, almost like I'm writing a new history for a character. Um, so writing this new alternate history is really, really playing with history, just kind of in a different way. Fantastic. I'm yeah, it is a little weird to say that you took inspiration from some and I, I get what you're saying. It's not inspiration. It's like it's I like the word that you used and said, like fuel for the fire. <laughs> just um great. And then just a reminder that if you have any questions, we are wrapping up soon. So put them in the chat so that our panelists can answer them. And then lastly, Ace. Yeah, so for me, when I'm building a world, the thing that I take from the most is, or my favorite aspect is definitely culture. Um, culture allows me to pull from my own culture, but then also explore different cultures around the world. And if I take little pieces and bits from certain cultures, I typically create my own culture for my group of citizens in that story. That's how it typically goes but speaking directly to for the royal of two face the royal with two faces um i took a lot from my own culture and i think one of my favorite things that i did with that in the story is i talk a lot about hair and about the different hairstyles and i use very descriptive language for it because i want people to be able to visualize that and see how actual black african american culture has been put into this book f like on purpose because culture is definitely my favorite aspect to play with. Love it. Um, and I'm not the only one I'm seeing also that folks are really excited about um, all these details that you're sharing about your stories. Um, we have an audience question from Blaine. Um, Ace gave the helpful tip of pulling from inspiration like Wakanda. I'm wondering how you all make sure you don't take a little too much inspiration and maintain your own original vision when world building. Um, so for this one, whoever wants to chime in, feel free. Um, okay, I can chime in. Uh, for me, considering I have been the one who has talked the most about pulling from different little pieces of this, that, and the third to make us a, a world, um, I always let my vision for my actual story take preface. Or So, like, if I'm pulling from Wakanda or I'm pulling from my own culture or I'm pulling from an uh, actual city, city in of the world, I only take what I know will fit directly into what I want. So 
um, I guess it's just a matter of making sure that your vision is taking the is being the first thing that you think about always because if you um if you don't then I feel like you're going to end up kind of just doing like a reboot or a remake of something that's already there but I typically try and keep it tuned into exactly what I want in my story and something just to add to what you just said Ace and something that I think you have um, talked a lot about is you feel very comfortable pulling from your own life <laughs> and your own experiences. Like when you write, so much of who you are is embedded into your world building. So I feel like by doing that, you are maintaining your own original vision while world building, right? Like um, your the experience you shared um, with like challenges with going to school, um, with, um, like incorporating or like something that's really important for you is talking about black hair. Um, like all of these little details are, they add, they add up to like, be like such a manifestation of you and you are the only, you are the only you. Um, so that's just something I wanted to add on before, um, I asked Chase and Isla, did you want to answer that question or are you good? <laughs> I would, I just want, I tend to, I guess I tend to stray from using inspiration like that. I know it's super helpful in some cases, but generally I do find that when I use inspiration, I just get like, I guess overwhelmed by it. And I start really adopting parts of my inspiration into my writing. I know this also happens when I'm reading something in particular and then my writing starts mimicking the style of that particular author. It's funny, but um, yeah, I would just say whenever I'm taking inspiration from something like that, it's usually from something that I know well enough so that I don't need to go back and watch it or reread it or something like that. So what I do is I just I just think about it generally. I write notes, not rereading or anything, on what I what specifically what elements I like to re I'd like to recreate from that. So just to avoid um, any any blending of styles there. Awesome. Thank you, Chase. Um, great. Okay. We'll, we'll hop back into our regularly scheduled programming and questions. <laughs> um, if anyone, anyone else, any audience questions pop up, I'll, I'll be sure to ask them. Um, what is an example, and we've been talking a lot about inspiration already, but, um, is there an example of world building, um, that n not necessarily inspires your novella, um, but just like inspires you as just a really good example of world building. Um, and, and why do you think it's such a good example for you? Um, and I'm going to start with Isla. Can you, wait, can you repeat the last part of your question really fast? <laughs> yeah, no worries. Um, so what is an example of world building that you just think is really good and why, why do you think it's so good? I think my one example that just leaps to my head, probably because I've been looking forward to reading them so much, um, are Chloe Gong's books, um, the, especially like These Violent Delights. And I think what sticks out to me the most is when a book has historical inspiration to it, but then it adds a layer of fantasy on top of it. So it's it's got that, like part of it is realistic and part of it is fantasy. And I feel like I'm learning about some place that really existed as well as like a fantastical world and that I really love. What about you, Chase? Um, so my immediate thought is Ray Bradbury. He's a very complicated author, but whenever I go back and read Fahrenheit 451 or any of his short stories, I'm always absolutely floored by his world building because these are stories, these are these are works that have been written so far in the past and their predictions of what our world looks like are so accurate um that i really it's it's an incredible example of world building that he was to he was able to predict the future in such a way um that he, yeah and whenever i read ray bradbury world building is definitely something i'm focusing on and trying to draw from his writing and lastly chase or not chase ace <laughs> Um, for me, as someone who is like a huge fantasy lover, um, this one book that I read by James Patterson called Witch and Wizard, um, 
it was just so great to me, especially for the world building aspect of it, because it takes place in a fake city that's supposed to be in the real world. And I love when they do that. It's like even um, Vampire Diaries, for example, did that as well. Like Mystic Falls does not actually exist, but it's like takes place in a city. I mean, a state that does exist. So I really love when any author does that. But um, Witch and Wizard also had like spells that were made of their from an actual like made up language. And I've always wanted to do that, but I've always struggled to do it. And um, also creating actual mystical objects is also something I've really wanted to do, but it's kind of like just something I've always struggled to do. So reading Witch and Wizard by James Patterson has always been like a huge thing that inspired me to at least step forward and try. Thank you all for, for sharing that. Um, and I, I do wanna be mindful of time. We only have a few minutes left. So I think it's super appropriate that our last question be, um, what is one piece of advice that you would give to writers working on world building right now? And I'm gonna kick us off with Chase. Yeah, I would say when, what I do when I'm really trying to focus on developing something in my writing is just write with a focus on that. I know it sounds kind of silly, just like, oh, focus on it, it, it gets better. But honestly, just continuing to practice these skills and plot, character, world building, anything, I tend to write very short pieces. Um, I try to keep them under 400, 500 words, just very, very short flash fiction pieces that really have a focus on world building. And in that way, I find that, I guess I just grasp that skill better. So I think just practice is key to improving in anything and especially in writing. Fantastic. Isla, what do you think? I'd say focus on the aspect of the world you're trying to create that like you care the most about or that excites you the most because I find that when I when I do that, the words come a lot easier. Like if I'm just trying to outline the whole world or something, then I'm like, Oh, uh, you get to the like the parts you don't like so much and then you don't write about it and then you're writing like you don't write as much and so yeah focus on the parts that you really love and then everything else will come after that an ace um for me I think the best piece of advice I could give is to not limit yourself to what you think should be in the world, but always include what you truly want in the world. I feel like if you try to limit yourself to what you think will be like something that's important in the world and you don't include anything that you think is just like a throwaway thing, but you really want it in the world, you're not going to be as attached to that world at the end of the day, like you can make a story your own. And if it's something that you truly want in that world, I feel like you should always include it. And, and I promise like at some point in time, as you're writing, you're going to find a way to make it fit. All really great advice. Um, great. Well, I know we have about a minute and <laughs> I see <laughs> the NaNoWriMo team has popped back on, but I just want to close out by saying thank you to NaNoWriMo for hosting another webinar with our youth authors. Um, thank you to our audience for um, honestly just hyping us up in the chat. I've been looking at it and I'm like, wow, so sweet. <laughs> I'm like, such sweet comments um, for each of us, even, even myself. I was like, oh, that's very nice. Um, and, and then of course, obviously, thank you so much to Chase, to Isla and Ace um, for taking the time to share their insights, to share more about their writing. I know writing is a very vulnerable thing. I personally think it's the closest thing that we can get to being in someone's mind is reading someone else's writing. Um, so it's just very meaningful that, um, you all were 
here to, to share your thoughts for a whole hour. Um, and then I wanted to quickly address Gabriella's question in the chat. Can we have the links to Ace, Chase, and Isla's stories? So exciting news that Ace, Chase, and Isla are three of the six authors whose works will be published on the Novelty Library all throughout this fall. Um, so if you would like to be the first to know when, when their books are available, um, make sure to subscribe to our Substack. Um, you can also follow us on social media um, and then you will be able to be the first ones to read it. Um, so I will pass it back over to the NaNoWriMo team. Um, I was just coming on to say thank you. Like it's always, I'm always super impressed um, by the, the authors you bring to chat with us and their advice. Um, now, we're, now we're reading about fire truck um, and that's a dog. There's just a lot happening right now in my world, <laughs> but I just wanted to say thank you. And I hope we get to do this again. And I'm really excited to read these pieces too. Um, and that's all. And if you um, want to send us a link to, I've included a link in the chat of, sorry, Bubba, of, um, our nano, that's a fire truck of our nano prep materials with world building stuff in it. If you haven't signed up for um, an official goal for NaNoWriMo 2023, I'll put that link in the chat as well. And we can make sure to add the link to your sub stack and to Novelty to the event description if we haven't yet, because I definitely want to read these <laughs> um, when they're public. So thank you so much. Bye. Um, hold on. Oh, hi, babies. Oh my goodness. I'm trying, I'm going to try to figure out how to end this. Well, I'll just end it here. Wow. Chaos. <laughs>